So just as Poussin's shepherds are forced by the discovery of this tomb to contemplate the presence of death in their Arcadian landscape, so we need to recognise that malign political philosophies can be found even in our archaeological Arcadia of the remote past. Now, I should say this, in terms of anything political, I might say, this is a personal view, not speaking on behalf of my organisation, but um, they have given me the opportunity to, um, to think about landscape and place and identity, and that work will inform what I'm, what I'm going to say. And more specifically, the paper was, was stimulated by sort of two recent developments um, in the press, really. Uh, various stories relating to ancient DNA results and their interpretation, often in old-fashioned migrationist and ethnic terms, the return of the, of the beaker folk, in effect. And secondly, demonstrating the risks attached to some of this research, the news that, um, that far-right groups have been gathering at prehistoric monuments, including Avery and Wayland Smithy, and not to mention more recently, some pretty close to far-right yeah. individuals. <laughs> It's only the third mention of this that we've had at the conference so far. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great meme. <laughs> um, as I only have 10 minutes, I won't discuss these in any detail, and I think others probably will, will touch on them. Um, there is, of course, an obvious contradiction between the two things. The DNA studies, um, which, if presented naively, can be misused in ethno-nationalist or even racist terms, actually obviously pretty much rule out any direct ancestral connection between Neolithic monuments and, and English <laughs> people today. Um, of course, it's not surprising that nationalist narratives lack intellectual coherence, but I think they also point to a problem with how heritage is often presented and, and received, which I suggest is partly our fault in the historic environment sector, and a problem that derives from what we can call um, genealogical thinking based on claims of ancestry in both sort of personal and national sense, um, otherwise known as, as nativism, which we might see as the, the slippery slope between nationalism and out-and-out -out fascism. So the idea of English heritage is, of course, intimately bound up with nationalism and the nation-state, organisations like Historic England in their original form and the development of heritage protection legislation belong to the, the very same period of the sort of early 20th century that produced the most problematic archaeological culture history. So a, a recent kind of necessary and welcome corrective to um, what uh, Laura Jane Smith and Emma Waterton call the authorised heritage discourse is the emergence of minority heritage. So rather than trying to persuade excluded or minority groups to accept dominant understandings of heritage, many new initiatives have recognised these other aspects of identity. Um, to paraphrase Stuart Hall, um, building a, a heritage of recognition alongside the, the heritage of equality. But I think we risk a new set of problems if we just leave it at that, because if heritage is bound up with identity in these terms, then some of it, like Anglo-Saxon history, as we've seen in, in recent arguments, or even prehistoric sites, can be claimed by different types of minority, the nationalist far right, based on egregious claims of direct descent or connection that are insufficiently challenged, perhaps, by a national heritage that relies on a, a more benign version of the same myth. Of course, there are many possible ways to develop a post-nationalist archaeology. Um, but what I'd like to consider is, is how we might better show that British prehistory is something which belongs to everyone who, who lives here. And I suggest one way of looking at the, the connection between past and present that is oppositional to, um, to genes and myths of ancestry takes the form of landscape. Put simply, we dwell where they once did, their round barrows, our roundabouts. But to show that connections to prehistory are not dependent on some mythical genealogical connection to the land, <coughs> um, I want to draw on a paper by Tim Ingold where he sets people's lived experience of inhabiting the, the landscape. Hopefully, you can read it at the bottom there. Um, he sets that lived experience against genealogy, arguing that it should not be descent that matters, but the relationships generated by an engagement with landscape. 
Now, Ingold's paper is talking about indigenous people in colonial contexts, but we can extend this argument closer to home, I think, since the, the genealogical model is, of course, deeply implicated in the, the discourse of the nation state and, and national heritage. Um, to illustrate the difference, Ingold reproduces Alfred Kroeber's model of a tree that grows together, in contrast to the, the genealogical tree with branches that fork and grow apart. And a relational model, he suggests, better reflects indigenous perceptions of their place in the world where people are connected through the inhabitation of places. And this relational world of dwelling is like that we envisage for the Neolithic, I think, because of the practices we um, investigate uh, and discover at prehistoric sites. So this is landscape emerging not from temporal genealogical connections, but spatial dwelling relationships. Genealogical ancestry doesn't count, and while residents may have a different perspective to visitors, one group is not, not privileged over the other. Which is not to say the landscape is ahistorical, of course it's not. Um, as Ingold puts it, land is history congealed. But both Avebury and Wayland Smithy um, have been built, lost, rediscovered at various times, and ultimately reconstructed um, to quite different appearances. So they're not timeless monuments but time-full places. And if there's one thing we can be sure of about landscape, even prehistoric ones, it's that they're always changing. So the question is, how do we widen that experience of inhabitation in the historic landscape? To me, the problem is not that Avebury and Waylands and similar sites that might be co-opted by the, the far right are Neolithic. They're problematic because they're, they're in the countryside. And it's rural heritage that we've often failed to diversify. But of course, you know, the rural idyll that is often put forward is, is a myth. We've had feudalism, civil wars, enclosure, unionization and mechanization. The countryside's natural beauty is the product of struggle and change, and that includes its prehistoric remains. Indeed, I suggest they can form a key part of the critique through the capacity they give us to imagine different forms of community. But um, once again, official discourse can kind of find itself a fellow traveller on, uh, on the nationalist road by promoting landscape almost solely in terms of beauty and nature without recognising this deep and complex and contested history. And I think this headline from a Guardian piece by the novelist Alex Preston gets to the heart of what we need to do. Although obviously the romantic when it comes to our rural landscape is always a, a siren call that's hard to resist. So I'll just, to end, I'll return to Arcadia, but this time the, the film, exploring our relationship with the land um, based on, on archive footage. Um, and given the ambiguities that are articulated here by the, by the director, reactions have, have varied from seeing this film as a, as a radical reimagining of the countryside to a deeply conservative celebration of unchanging traditions and at a a piece written by the environmentalist Paul Kingsnorth got such a backlash from other writers that it was removed from the, the film's website. And, and there's, there's much to, um, to discuss here, and I don't have time, but you can read the, the Twitter spat and, and make your mind up. The point is that turn of phrase matters. If you're going to write about Aboriginal Britain or patriotism, the real kind, you are, however unintentionally, offering dog whistles to fascists. And it's not that far to the conversation reported in Helen MacDonald's um, H's for Hawk. And we know that's how some people might think about Avebury and Waylands and sites like that. So I think the remedy, as in Ingold's paper, is to separate the blood from the soil, the genealogy from the land. And we need to follow these debates about uncomfortable fascist threads in some of the new nature writing because they're relevant to us too. And landscape, as I've said, isn't just nature and beauty, it's fundamentally archaeological. Um, there's also, of course, this folk horror vibe in the, in the movie Arcadia, and I think on the positive side, it sort of adds this kind of strangeness, it uh, unsettles the, the countryside. And similarly, in, in response to, to nationalist appropriation, we can make prehistory stranger and turn it into this, this other. So it's not just about promoting a multicultural story in opposition to a conservative past, but also to, to imagine a radical future where the Neolithic can perhaps offer different perspectives on community, identity 
and place. We can also do this in urban settings um, and we can look at concepts of uh, landscape justice, um, <coughs> developing archaeological contributions there. So perhaps we can temper the iconic megaliths, the shadow of the stones that always looms over the public archaeology of the Neolithic with different radical prehistories which can help unsettle the idea that rural landscape is something ancestral for white folk, irrelevant to ethnic minorities and urban working classes, off-puttingly aesthetic and unchanging, as Elvis Costello put it. Thanks.